AEDT 1170U Psychological Foundations and Digital Technology Module 3 Video Clip 3.3 Memory How many gigabytes do you have? Here are the guiding questions for this video. Describe the phenomenon of human memory and give some characteristics of memory. Understand the differences between computer and human memory. List some strategies for encoding information and boosting your memory. And what retrieval cues for information can you use and which ones does your computer use? The phenomenon of memory. Memory is really any indication that learning has persisted over time. It is our ability to store and retrieve information. And studying memory's extremes has helped researchers to understand how memory works. Your memory capacity is most apparent in your recall of unique and highly emotional moments in your past. We all remember where we were when 9-11 occurred, our wedding, a child's birth, or death of a significant person. These are called flashbulb memories because they're clear memories of an emotionally significant moment or event. Human memory is like a computer's information processing system in one way. Three processes still occur. Encoding, which is the process of information getting into the brain, storage, the retention of encoded information over time, and retrieval, the process of getting information out of memory storage. But how is human memory different than computer memory? Computers process information sequentially and quickly, but the human brain is slower and does many things at once using something we call parallel processing. Our memories are less literal and more fragile than a computer's, and we have the capability to attach significant meaning and emotion to memory. There's a three-stage processing for human memory. First of all, we start with sensory memory. We record information to be remembered in our sensory system. This then moves into short-term memory, which is an activated memory that holds a few items briefly, such as the seven digits of a phone number, before the information is stored or forgotten. Working memory is kind of a similar concept that focuses more on the processing of a briefly stored memory. And our long-term memory, which is a relatively permanent and limitless storehouse of our memory system. How do we encode information? Well, we get information through several processes either automatic processing, which is unconscious encoding of incidental information such as time, space, or well-learned information such as the meaning of a word, and effortful processing, which is encoding that requires attention and conscious effort, such as studying for an exam. We can boost our memory through several specific strategies. Rehearsal, which is the conscious repetition of information, the spacing effect is the tendency for distributed study or practice to yield better long-term retention of information than is achieved through a mass study or practice. So if you've ever pulled an all-nighter studying, you know why that doesn't work. The serial position effect refers to our tendency to immediately recall the last items well and the first items nearly as well. So if you go for a job interview, you should want to be either first or last so the interviewers remember you well. We also encode meanings, like the difference between the words ice cream and I scream. We use context to give meaning to words that sound the same. Imagery can help us create a visual image and remember, and mnemonics are used to remember long lists of items. Our memory is helped by encoding visually and semantically in images and words. Chunking information and organizing it into meaningful units can help, as can making a hierarchy where a few broad concepts are divided and subdivided, like in an organizational chart. How do we store information? An iconic memory refers to a sensory memory of a visual stimuli, like a photograph or a picture image memory that lasts a few tenths of a second and an echoic memory refers to a sensory memory of auditory stimuli, something we can hear that can be recalled within three or four seconds. Our short-term memory has a limited life in both duration and capacity, and we're usually better for digits than for random letters, and better for information that we hear than for Im images that we see. Our long-term memory, again, is essentially limitless. The average adult has about a billion bits of information in memory and a storage capacity that is a million times greater. So, you may actually have more gigabytes than your laptop. We don't store information with exactactness, like a computer. We, we store it as a memory trace. 
Memory does not reside in a single specific place in the brain. Long-term memories can survive shock therapy and changes occur in the gaps between the neurons where nerves communicate and this is how we um, say that learning and remembering happens. And what is amnesia? If this refers to the loss of memory. It can be because of damage to the brain that results in amnesia where we forget certain pieces of information. Implicit memory is independent of our conscious recollection, such as you don't have to remember how to brush your teeth for most people. But an explicit memory is a memory of facts that we consciously know and declare, such as when did you last brush your teeth. What parts of the brain are involved in memory? The amygdala is one of the most important because that is where we process emotions such as fear and anger laden memories. And remember that it is easier to attach a strong emotion to a strong memory. The hippocampus, located on both sides of your brain, has differing functions and that's where new explicit memories are laid down. And the cerebellum tends to lay down memories for skills and some conditioned associations. What happens with stress in memory? If we all taken exams and had stressful experiences, I think we know the answer to that. Because the amygdala processes emotion and boosts activity in the brain's memory forming areas, this explains why we remember things with strong emotional attachments and why stress can prevent us retrieving information. A stronger emotional experience makes for a stronger memory. Memory is essentially a learning that has persisted over time or information that has been stored and can be retrieved. The study of memory is part of cognitive psychology, which also includes the study of language, problem solving, and other internal mental processes. Throughout our lives, we are constantly bombarded by our senses. Everything we see, hear, and smell cannot possibly be recorded into memory. Each of our five senses taste, touch, smell, hearing, and sight all begin as electrical impulses traveling through the brain. As each sensation relates to one another, tiny synaptic junctions form. These are basics for how memories are stored within the brain. As each relates to one another, the memory formation becomes stronger and more accessible. Essentially, our brains remember things by association. For example, when we remember what we have for breakfast, our brains will recall all the details recorded from our senses, such as the smell of burnt toast, the taste of orange juice after brushing our teeth, or whether or not it was a sunny morning. All these details combined go into creating memories. In a sense, memories are less like a film strip and more like a complex network of stored sensations. How do we retrieve our memories? Recalling memory is a measure of memory in which the person has to retrieve information that they learned earlier like a fill-in-the-blank test. Recognition memory is where the person identifies something they previously learned, such as a multiple choice test. And relearning is a measure of memory that assesses the amount of time saved when you're learning the material for the second time, such as in relearning a language you learned in childhood. Retrieval cues can be helped by priming your memory, which is identifying a strand that leads to a specific memory by recognizing a diagram, a word, or a familiar note of music. And again, mnemonic devices can serve as good retrieval cues. Sometimes using the context is a good way to help you remember because it puts you back in the context where the memory occurred, such as studying in the room where you're going to take the exam. Deja vu happens because we were probably in a context similar to one where we've been before, so the current situation is loaded with similar cues that we've been here before. And emotions are good retrieval cues. Memories tend to be mood congruent. We remember happy events when we're happy and sad events when we're sad. What happens when we forget? It just means that memory has not entered our long-term memory. As we age, this can affect our encoding areas, so young adults can encode new information faster than older adults. We also have some storage decay, such as forgetting curve that says the rate of forgetting is usually rapid at the beginning and then levels off over time. Failure to retrieve a memory can also occur due to interference. This could be either proactive interference, which means we have a disruptive effect of prior learning when we recall something new. 
For example, learning French first can sometimes interfere with learning the next language. Or retroactive interference, which means that learning the new language can make you forget the French that you used to know. A few other applications of memory. The misinformation effect is something that we've all experienced, where after exposure to subtle misinformation, many people may misremember. We tend to fill in our memories to revise our history. This is why eyewitness testimony is rarely accurate. Repression is Freud's term that we use as a defense mechanism to repress some painful memories. And sometimes we have source amnesia, that we attribute the wrong source or event to what we experienced or imagined, and this can be the source of many false memories. We know that memories recovered from hypnosis are unreliable, and memories before the age of two or three are usually extremely unreliable. Here are the synthesis questions for this video. Has the importance of human memory decreased as we depend on technology to store, organize, and retrieve our memories? What functions do you depend on your computer to do now that you used to have to memorize? For example, spelling, a thesaurus, or bigger ones such as car repair that's done by technology or medical diagnostic machines. How has your relationship with technology changed your priorities in terms of memory? Given how limitless our brains appear to be, do you think technology will eventually supersede the human brain's capacity for information storage and retrieval? I look forward to tutorial this week.